So basically this James Webb telescope, they launched it. It's out doing the Hubble telescope. It's Hubble telescope 2.0. We have a deployed telescope in orbit, said Thomas Zerbuchen, NASA's associate administrator for science. Magnificent telescope, the likes of which the world has never seen. And that's them partying in the room. It's so like a Windows 95 party. Fuck yeah. Yeah, what intrigued me was somebody said uh, on Twitter, one of the scientists said that 99% of the people won't appreciate what this is. But if you know, then you know. So I was like, whoa, what the... And it turns out this is pretty amazing. The uh, It's... it's uh, fucking... Sorry. The, it's like a big mirror made of gold plates. It will give... It said it will give Webb and humanity a chance to see the universe as it was perhaps only a hundred million years after the start of the Big Bang. So the Hubble telescope hasn't been able to get that far back, but this one will. Yeah, and it's, it's focused on like what four areas, right? Um, yes, four area four areas of focus. Do you have those in front of you? Uh, yeah, I have the. I do. You want me to share? Uh, I have it right here. Yep, there it is. Right there, under first line reionization. Yeah, so there's four areas that this telescope is going to study. First light reionization refers to the early stages of the universe after the Big Bang started the universe as we know it today. In the first stages after the Big Bang, the universe was a sea of particles, such as electrons, protons, and neutrons. Light wasn't visible until it cooled enough later on. The epoch of reionization refers to when neutral hydrogen was reionized, made to have an electrical charge again by radiation from the first stars. So it's looking at this looking for this reionization process in the light yeah. that is capturing from the deep Deep, yeah. deep, deep space. I was stumbling earlier because I, I was trying to get into how it was built. Um, but my notes didn't make sense. So thanks for saving it. Go I got here. you, bro. That's why I'm here. Just just a co-host. Um, I'm also just a co-host. We're two, man. And then it's looking at Assembly of Galaxies. Assembly of galaxies sounds complicated. It's a useful looking at galaxies is a useful way to see how matter is organized on gigantic scales, which in turn gives us hints as to how the universe evolved. Which brings in this book I read about before when the Earth had two moons. I got it at Barnes and Noble on the premiere shelf, so they're not trying to hide this. Apparently, there was a time when the Earth had two moons. What? Yeah, and it has to do with the formation of galaxies and planets like this. And um, that book talks a lot about this. And it's kind of boring, but basically the theory is that like a piece of debris hit Earth and caused some piece of piece of debris to fly off of Earth into mm. space. And then what happens in space is that things will naturally find their circle. So there's this wobbly with it, blah blah blah. And then as it finds its circle, it gets caught in our whatever. Orbit. Yeah, but uh, there was a time where there was like two pieces that became one. So it was like two moons. But somewhere in here, that's what they're trying to watch is like how the moon was formed is are things they'll be able to understand more with things like the James Webb, James Webb telescope that's going to be looking at 100 million years after the Big Bang formation of planets. Yeah, they're looking back at the earliest galaxies that we could see to figure out uh, if we could figure out why, how how and why we get these spiral and elliptical galaxies that have evolved today. This is looking at the birth one. of stars and protoplanetary systems. My favorite one, the Eagle Nebula's Pillars of Creation. It's going to look at these. They're some of the most famous birthplaces for stars, and I have it right here. Let me. This is the Eagle Nebula. Whoa. It's a real place. The classic image of pillars of creation inside the Eagle Nebula reveals a stellar nursery where new stars may be hatched. So basically, they're going to be looking into these early gas clouds like this. Because in these gas clouds, you get the formation of stars because the gas starts to merge together and ba ba ba. And then there you go. And now the stars are in there. And then what I thought was interesting that I learned from that other article we were just on, like that cocooning gas cloud apparently is reused unless it, if it doesn't use or isn't, isn't 
dispersed too far apart. So like it, it's used to form one star, and then it like continues to go on to do to to be used again. It's kind of cool. Yeah, right there. Stars come to be in clouds of gas, and as the stars grow, the radiation pressure they exert blows away the cocooning gas, which could be used again for other stars if not too widely dispersed. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to use the James Webb Telescope's infrared section to be able to look at the sources of heat inside those uh, gas clouds, which will include stars that are being born in these cocoons. Inside these uh, pillars of creation that you just showed a picture of from the other article. Yeah, and just real quick, in 1995, about the the nebula, the Eagle Nebula, the world was astounded by the Hubble Space Telescope's beautiful images of the Eagle Nebula, a cloud of interstellar gas and dust 7,000 light years away. So basically, that's that was getting back to kind of the origin of the James Webb Telescope was the Hubble. It's Hubble 2.0. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Just, but it's going deeper into space and is built a little better. And we'll get into that. We'll get into that. You know, we'll look at those things. But there's one more, the fourth one, planets and origins of life. The last decade has seen vast numbers of exoplanets discovered, including with NASA's planet-seeking Kepler Space Telescope. JWST's powerful sensors will be able to peer at those planets in more depth, including, in some cases, imaging their atmospheres. Understanding the atmospheres and the formation conditions for planets can help scientists better predict if certain planets are habitable or not. Interesting. Uh, So it has a, a shiny giant mirror made of gold hexagons. And it's, dude, that looks amazing. Is that made of real gold or just gold colored? It's coated with a durable gold. It's made of another, it's made of a different, trying to get to the beginning of my notes. It's made of a different material. 18 small mirrors that together will allow mission teams to use the scope to measure light from extremely distant galaxies. Webb's primary mirror spans 21 feet, 4 inches, 6 across, and is made up of 18 hexagonal mirror segments. It's a big-ass um, mirror. I'm um, right here. Mm-hmm. Measuring 4.3 feet. I'll read that again. The primary mirror spans 21 feet, 4 inches across. It's made up of 18 hexagonal mirrors, 4.3 feet. 4.3, dude. What if it's actually 4.3200? 43,200. Sacred numbers. Um, 21, 21 feet. These are sacred numbers, actually. And Webb also has a small secondary mirror that measures 2.4 feet. Ba, 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 ba. Well, the, in comparison to the Hubble Space Telescope, so, so the Webb's primary mirror was 21 feet. The Hubble was 7.8. Crazy. It's a lot larger. Dude, that's huge. I'm not getting the pictures. On that one. Look at that beautiful. beautiful. It's insane looking. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an illustration, but they use the hexagons so that it will be more like a circle because that's the best shape, and they talk about yeah. it here. If the segments were circular, there would be gaps between them. A roughly circular overall mirror shape is desired because that focuses the light into the most compact region on the detectors. An oval mirror would give images that are elongated. A square mirror would send it out. So they needed to replicate a circle, so they used hexagons. There's six actuators on the back of each mirror piece. Listen to this, dude. This is insane. The actuators that move the piece. It's going to take them like five months to calibrate this once it gets located. That's how nuanced. These actuators are actually a pretty amazing piece of engineering in the sense that they can move long strokes called core stage, but they also have a fine stage which can move extremely precise fractional wavelengths of light. Wow, that's crazy. It's like... That's crazy. The precision that we can get with this uh, technology nowadays. Yeah. Um, NASA had an art challenge because it looks so beautiful. Look at their art challenge. Let me find it. She wins. She gets my vote. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That one's cool too. That's neat. This guy just printed a picture off of a Google search. What a dick. Yeah. Overachiever right here. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. We also let the fucking kids win, man. What's wrong with you, fucking adults? Yeah. Oh, of course we've got the the older lady that's like attention seeking bitch. Yeah. I. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's Sorry. the art show, everybody. Sorry, it's pissing me off. It's supposed to be for the kids, and you have all these fucking adults. Look, oh, let me. I want to get my picture yeah. on the NASA website, dude. I don't have time to submit art to NASA. I got, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't have time exactly. for that. So, why is it gold? To answer your question, for one, it's extremely reflective, which is readily apparent in its brilliant appearance. Um, gold has the highest reflectivity over a very wide wavelength band. You build a large telescope to catch individual photons, so you want the reflectivity of each of these coatings to be extremely high so we don't lose photons along the way. Webb's mirrors are about 98% reflective, which means they reflect 98% of incoming photons, which is about as reflective as it gets. That's and a it's a rugged coating. Yeah, it's a protective gold overcoat. So they're not actually made of solid gold, they're made of beryllium. Yeah. Strong, that, lightweight metal. Uh, each one weighs 46 pounds. Damn. Yeah. Super interesting that stuff, man. I'll be curious to see it, what we learn about the beginning of all of time. Yeah, and essentially what we're what this thing is studying, right? What's even cooler is that um it uses infrared, whereas the Hubble uses the other ones. Does it use infrared? I forget what it uses. Uh, Webb observes in infrared light. Since infrared light is essentially heat, if Webb were too warm, it wouldn't be able to detect infrared light past the glow of its own mirror. In fact, Webb's mirrors need to be about minus 364 degrees uh, to work as intended. To keep it cold, the scope will be sent into deep space where it deploys sun shields to shade its mirrors and other instruments from any lingering warmth. Uh, so this is why it's going to orbit a million miles from Earth. In that whatever zone it's called, Lagrange point. Yeah, and Lagrange. I. Um, Lagrange. The Lagrange points. <laughs> Sorry. You're going to have a picture. This is the Lagrange point, like a, a sweet spot where there's little to no gravity. Um, and it's shielded from the sun, basically. Yeah, the observatory sports a five-layer sun shield that will be as big as a tennis court when it's unfurled. I want to cover more of the Lagrange point because that was a, a Lagrange point is a gravitationally stable spot where spacecraft can more or less park, maintaining the same relative position without expending much fuel. Webb isn't going to L2 for propellant con conservation. It's going there to stay cool. So it's going to save fuel. They've estimated it's going to save twice as much fuel as they're prepared for, which is 10 years, so up to 20. But it's there because it has to stay cold because it's infrared. It's going to shield itself from the sun. And it's interesting because it said the, tempers, the temperature difference between the hot and cold sides with the telescope is huge. You could boil water on one side and freeze nitrogen on the other. Holy shit. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, right? So it's going to take 29 days for it to get there. The distance to L2 highlights another key difference between Hubble and Webb. The Hubble telescope was designed to be serviced by spacewalking astronauts, but no one's going to be there for the James Webb. It's going to be all by its lonesome because it's 930,000 miles away. Um, wait, wait, wait. And a number of In others. In the sunward have, direction. It's away from the sun. The, the James Webb goes away from the sun. So I, I, I need to clarify what I just read. It's in the Marsward direction. The James Webb is in the Marsward direction. Hmm. But how far is it? 130,000 miles. Sun Earth L1 Lagrange point is 930,000 miles in the Sunward direction. That's where other telescopes hmm. have worked before. What's special about the James Webb is it's going in the Marsward direction away from the sun. At L2. To Lagrange point L2 because there's four of them total in the solar system. There are a total of five Sun-Earth Lagrange points. Five, sorry. L3 is in line with L1 and L2, but on the other side of the Sun. L4 and L5 are 60 degrees ahead of and behind the Earth, respectively, on our planet's orbital path. 
But it doesn't say how far L2 is. Here's L1 and L2. They look to be about the same, just on the opposite side. 900. 900 L1 is done. Miles. Yeah, 930,000 miles to L1 and then 930,000 miles uh, L2. Wow. And and these are the Lagrange points. So if you go up here, you'll be in like minimal gravity. That's a pretty sacred shape. Look how even that triangle yeah. is. You know what I'm saying? And I'm and, even and geometry. Yeah, and this line is the same length as this line. Even though here there's not a Lagrange point, I would like to know the deep physics because the geometry looks to be pretty symmetrical, but there's got to be some kind of physics disconnect that doesn't allow another Lagrange point, even though geometrically it seems like there would be another Lagrange point here and here. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like what are the physics? Like opposite that opposite of that L4 and L5. Yeah, maybe in these points there's like an anti-Lagrange point where gravity is so strong you can't get out. Like a Bermuda Triangle. Maybe you and I are just so dumb when it comes to astrophysics that uh, <laughs> we'll never figure it out, me and you. No, I'm actually really smart, and I think I just did figure it out. Yeah, probably so. So instead of writing a thesis, I'm just going to clip that 40-second video and send it to Harvard Say, and with a letter that says, what's up now? <laughs> Where's my tenure position? With like my credits from community college. Yeah, I, I deserve tenure. Yeah. Please. I figured out Lagrange points six and seven. Um, that definitely wraps up everything. But here's awesome, live man. updates. We can finish it with the live updates page of James Webb. The most recent update, let me refresh this. This is the live update page. Look, here's a little illustration of how it works. I get it out of reader view. Oh, really? You can't see that? Now refresh it. Do you see this illustration? Yeah, I see the illustration. That's what I was trying to show you. I'll refresh it in a second. But look how, boom, and That's then it... Pretty neat. Dude, they got to calibrate all of that. You got... I mean, you know what it's like mixing music. You move one thing, you change one thing, you got to change everything. Everything else. is fucked, yeah. You imagine calibrating one of these hexagons and you're looking at I the can next... can move at a fraction of a wavelength of light. Yeah, and it's like another two and a half weeks to figure out what you did. Like, fuck. It's going to take forever. God damn fuck. it. When, when you hit... By you the just, time this thing is calibrated, it's going to be out of fuel. Because that illustration, look at that. There, how many times does it reflect? One, two, three, four, four, five. Four times. Two, three. Five, three, three, four, four. Oh yeah, four, three, four, dude. But that's how you get these pictures of collecting light like that. That's amazing. I can't wait to see what it fucking uh, finds. Um, the live update. We'll wrap up on what the latest is. Adjustments to the as of eight thirty three this morning. I think. Adjustments to the 18 golden mirror segments of Webb's primary mirror are due to begin tomorrow, January 11th. Today is the 10th. According to the deployment timeline provided by NASA, the, that process is expected to take several days and marks the observatory's transition from deployment into commissioning. Meanwhile, the observatory continues its trek out to its station orbiting Earth-Sun Lagrange Point 2, or L2, which is located about 1 million miles away from Earth on the side opposite the Sun. As of today, the telescope, January 10th, the telescope is more than 78% of the way to orbit, having traveled more than 700,000 miles from Earth. Damn. 